Thank you very much. We will now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, health care is in crisis. In every corner of this province, the system is under severe stress, and that's, that's obviously true uh, even in Metro as well. And as the Premier would know, the Cobblequid Community Health Centre has been overcrowded for most of this session and for quite some period of time. It was built initially, the emergency room, for 21,000 patients. Last year, it saw upwards of 50,000 patients. Uh, the Premier talks about a plan for uh, a significant health care infrastructure. I think he says the biggest health care infrastructure investment in history. And time will tell if that's another uh, grandiose, grandiose uh, statement by the Premier. But, uh, but I'd like to ask the Premier, included in that uh, $2 billion investment, is there any plan uh, for, for an expansion of the Cobblequid Centre? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the gentleman for the question. Uh, as he would know, uh, we uh, announced the redevelopment of the QE2 here in Metro, which is the as part of that was the expansion that's taken place in the Darkness General. The third and fourth floors are completed. Uh, the uh, four additional operating theaters are being uh, uh, added to that facility. The fifth floor will be finalized. Uh, that will become a really uh, a center of excellence around orthopedic surgery. Uh, he'll also know that we've talked about moving uh, the outpatients portion, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, some of the day surgeries that will go into the new facility out in Clayton Park. Uh, as well as dialysis and some other uh, services that are being, basically, Mr. Speaker, services that uh, those who live outside uh, uh, the, the, the downtown core would be receiving. It saves them from coming downtown. And at the same time, we will continue to enhance the HI site. Uh, when those are developed, he absolutely is right. It is the largest healthcare infrastructure development in the history of this province. Uh, and I want to assure the honourable member and all those in Sackville Cobblequid that the Cobblequid Centre will be parked of that continuing evolution of how we provide services, not only to those who live in the, here in the central core, but those of us who live outside. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The continuing evolution was the, was the only reference I heard to the, to the Cobblequid Community Health Centre. There's an impressive array of clinics uh, offered at the, at the centre by an impressive group of uh, healthcare professionals. The demand is there for more clinics, but the physical space is not there. Now, the AG has highlighted the need for an actual health care plan in this province. I suspect that if the province had an actual plan as to how health care would be delivered over the next 10, 20 years, that we would see an expansion of the Cobblequid Centre, but we're not hearing that. Um, but first off, I'd like to ask the Premier, is the, is the Auditor General correct when he says that there's no plan, there's no health care plan, and, and how can we proceed with a $2 billion investment when we don't have an actual plan? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've clearly laid out a plan uh, for the redevelopment of the QE2. Mr. Speaker, I just clearly laid out uh, the Honourable Member uh, changes. I, I certainly believe the people of Darkness recognize there's a plan with the investments we've made uh, there in the Darkness General. I believe the, the, the people in, in and around uh, uh, Clayton Park will recognize the plan. When we look at the outpatient clinic, those who come in the 103, the 101, the 102, who provide services downtown will recognize that. I want to assure the honourable member the Cobblequid uh, Centre is part of that ongoing journey as we continue to make sure that we provide those services. Uh, he's very right. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that's taking place uh, it, right now at the Cobblequid Centre. I would dare say many of our own families uh, have received uh, services out of that facility, and we see it as an important part of the evolution of, of health care. What, what the honourable member should know, though, Mr. Speaker, the QE2 uh, redevelopment has been uh, talked about, uh, Mr. Speaker, for more than a decade. It's finally getting done. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Time will tell, Mr. Speaker, how it gets done and when it gets done. In fact, we've been asking for a risk assessment. Has the government looked at the risk of it not proceeding in the right time? <laughs> Haven't seen that. <laughs> Haven't seen an actual plan uh, for health care delivery in this province. Instead, what we hear is sound bites. And I think that's the history of this government, too, as they manage to the podium. Get to the podium. Make a sound bite, and then we'll see what happens after that. But health care is more important than that. And before the Premier starts writing $2 billion checks, he should have an actual plan. So I'd like to ask him one more time, does he see anything for the Cobblequid, uh, for the Cobblequid Community Health Centre in the $2 billion check that he's planning to write right now? The Honourable Premier. To, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we do a plan, provide a plan for the overall delivery of health care across our province. I want to ensure... Uh, the Honourable Member that Cobbequid is part of that, uh, Mr. Speaker. I will tell you 
uh, health care providers across this province are excited about the investments we're making in physical infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they're excited about the second OR we've opened in Windsor, Mr. Speaker. They're excited about the, uh, the work that's happening at the HI site right now on the fifth floor, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they're also, uh, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member would know we're the first government in history to put a health committee together. Uh, last week they talked about the redevelopment in Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker, and finally. The Honourable Member now agrees that that's a good idea, Mr. Speaker, as we continue down the road to make those investments. I hope he will continue to change his mind and not look for a political reason to complain about everything when he then has to, Mr. Speaker, backtrack on his complaints because he knows it's a good thing for Nova Scotia. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Still no plan. Mr. Speaker, the government is spending more than $1,000 per day per person keeping hundreds of long-term care residents living in our hospitals when the cost would be just a, a fraction of that to have these people living in nursing homes. But instead of that, we've been keeping them in our hospitals, which is causing no end of problems from the point of view of patient flow. And in five and a half years, the government has not opened a single new nursing home facility. I want to ask the Premier, wouldn't it be better to spend smart up front on a comprehensive program of new nursing home construction than to continue spending stupid on totally unnecessary Order, hospitalization. Order, please. I'd like to remind the honourable member, the honourable leader for the New Democratic Party that the word stupid is an unparliamentary term, and I'll ask him to retract that. The honourable leader of the New Democratic Party. I'd be Party. happy to retract it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I ask, is the word unsmart parliamentary? But what I mentioned earlier is, is you should not say indirectly what you cannot say directly. <laughs> so, we'll leave it at that. The Honourable Premier. I want to thank uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member for the question. I, I also want to thank him uh, for continuing this session to raise the issues that I know he believes that are passionate, that, uh, that are issues that are coming from him that are at, uh, impact individual families that not only he represents, that all of us represent. I want to tell him the issue of long-term care is an important one. Uh, as he knows, part of the redevelopment in Cape Breton will be part of adding uh, long-term care beds, a facility, and we're adding additional ones in two redevelopment projects that we're having in other parts of the province. Uh, we continue to monitor the situation. I also want to tell him one of the things that I've heard loud and clear from my constituents and people across this province is they want to stay home as long as possible. Uh, the investments we're making uh, in home care, is in, uh, which we have every budget, Mr. Speaker, that we've introduced, is continuing to support that. Uh, but we will continue to reassess uh, where the long-term care beds are required as we continue to make capital investments. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the government has failed to hire the number of nurses needed to provide adequate care to the patients of the province. Instead, they overran the nurses' overtime budget by $15 million last year in an ad hoc non-system that is pushing nurses hard in the direction of stress and burnout. Why can't the Premier see that this, too, is a case of failing to spend smart up front, thereby necessitating spending deeply ill-advisedly down the road? <laughs> The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Again, I want to tell him uh, we're very proud of the investments we continue to make uh, in health care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as you would know, in the earlier question I have with the Leader of the Opposition, physical infrastructure has been allowed to decay in this province through successive governments making substantial investments. We believe that will, uh, will not only provide us to be able to provide high quality care that Nova Scotians are expecting, it will allow us to attract. Uh, health care providers who want to work in new and modern facilities, and I want to assure the honourable member, as the number of seats that have been added to the nursing schools in our province will continue to add, uh, will continue to hire those uh, students. Uh, almost all of them get jobs in Nova Scotia. I also want to tell the honourable member that the nurse practitioner positions that we've added is continue to heighten the scope of, of nurses across our province. We are adding family practice nurses in our communities. Those are all uh, important steps, Mr. Speaker. This is a government that recognizes the important role nurses play uh, and the diverse role that nurses play in delivering uh, health care to our citizens. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, similarly, 33 per cent of pediatric day surgeries at the IWK are related to tooth decay in kids. 
Children with tooth decay are more susceptible to oral health problems down the road, some of which can lead to increased risk of chronic illnesses, including diabetes and heart disease. If we spent smart by guaranteeing that kids could get their teeth cleaned for free at school, we might not have to be spending so much if deeply ill-advisedly later on caring for chronic illnesses that could uh, completely be avoided. So can the Premier explain what the point is of failing to invest upfront uh, in prevention at the cost of spending so many millions in mop-up later. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue to make investments, Mr. Speaker, uh, providing uh, quality health care to our citizens. The, the issue the Honourable Member brings to the floor around dental care for a young Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, is an important one, one that we need to make sure uh, that as we uh, invest in providing dental care, Mr. Speaker, it's done in a way that those who require our support the most uh, receive it. Uh, there are many kids in this province currently today who have dental plans, the parents have dental plans. We need to make sure that those who do not those who are living in a socioeconomic disadvantage and circumstances provide the support uh, of our problems, of our government early on, and I look forward to continuing to work with the Dental Association to ensure that we can ensure, Mr. Speaker, that all children have access uh, to that care. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotia has a population of 960,000. Last year, our provincial nominee program quota was 1,350. Manitoba has a population of 1.4 million. But their provincial nominee program, program quota was 5,700. So their, so their provincial population is higher, but their, their quota is 320 percent higher. I'd like to ask the Premier, why is our immigration quota so much lower than Manitoba's? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, when we came into government, uh, the quote number of the Honourable Members quoting was 500. Uh, the former Conservative government increased to 650. Uh, we continue to see that number climb. I want to congratulate the Minister of Immigration uh, for uh, her tremendous work. Uh, we would also know uh, in the last, uh, working with the current national government, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been able to pick up the nominee programs in our, in our sister province in Atlantic Canada that aren't being used. Uh, he would also know that we have 2,000 nominees that are uh, in a broader prospect for the economy of Atlantic Canada. We continue to use those. And because of the hard work of the Minister of Immigration and the importance this government places on a diverse province, Mr. Speaker, we've seen a record number of new people coming to Nova Scotia. But equally as important, Mr. Speaker, we're seeing a record number of those people choosing to stay, live, work. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Immigration is critically important to growing our economy, Mr. Speaker. If we want to grow our economy, we need more people. That's a simple, that's a simple fact. And, and the numbers are going up. But the disparity between what our provinces is receiving and other provinces is pretty dramatic. We've had a two-term uh, majority Liberal government here, majority Liberal government in Canada. Every single federal uh, member in the land of Canada was Liberal. This was the time to actually make very, very significant strides. And yet, we know that uh, 2016, 13 of Nova Scotia's 18 consensus divisions experienced population loss. Halifax grew by 8% over those over a 10-year period, but Guysborough shrank by 16%, Shelburne 10%, Inverness 10%, Digby 9%. The immigration and population decline dwarfs the trickle of immigrants, particularly to rural Nova Scotia. Can the Premier, can the Premier enlighten us, House, of the few immigrants that go to rural Nova Scotia? How many actually stay there after five years? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, the Honourable Member is completely incorrect, Mr. Speaker. We continue to see uh, uh, people from around the world choosing to come and live and work in this province. He's completely incorrect when he talks about the fact that the number hasn't continued to increase, Mr. Speaker. We've continued to hit every target, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Immigration has hit every target. Mr. Speaker, those that go into rural communities are choosing to live and work in those communities, Mr. Speaker, where the Honourable Member talks about we've reversed the trend of out-migration of young people. The third consecutive year, we see more young people stay here, Mr. Speaker. Part of that is through the immigration strategy. And I want to tell the Honourable Member, the Minister of Immigration is going to continue to be passionate, work hard to ensure that not only do we continue to grow our capital city, but we continue to grow all across our province, Mr. Speaker. He should take a lesson, Mr. Speaker, from the president of the, uh, Cape Breton University, Mr. Speaker, who welcomed how many international students to that university, changing the landscape of Cape Breton Island, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work with the people, Mr. Speaker, have a positive image of immigration and not a negative one. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Business. Yesterday in question period, the Minister of Business said there was nothing he could do to help former miners seeking an extension of their WCB benefits. But I think there is something he and his government can do. Make an extraordinary exemption for former DEVCO miners only. It would allow their benefits to continue for the rest of their lives. This change would not cost the province any money as the benefits for the miners would be paid for by the federal government. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Business admit that there is a way to help these former miners that doesn't cost the province millions of dollars? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for the question. It is important uh, that uh, all of the Cape Breton members uh, who are, who are uh, intimately involved in the DEVCO situation be on the record on this, so I do appreciate it. Um, that what the member is asking is not accurate. Uh, it's this, the, the DEVCO miners are federal employees, Mr. Speaker. The only mechanism we have through the, the Workers' Compensation Act would be to change the number from 65 to perpetuity, which is not, wouldn't cost the province, uh, it wouldn't be zero, it would be a billion dollars. It's not something, if, if I can finish, please. Um, is so th this is a conversation that's been very unfairly categorized. The federal government have suggested, uh, their bu some bureaucrats have suggested that this money is sitting somewhere, when in fact what they said was if we change our legislation, they will be forced to pay. That is not a, a fair uh, way to present this situation. We have met with a, for a number of years with the DEVCO miners, Mr. Speaker. We want to do whatever we can to help, but we can't change our provincial legislation for federal employees. We've got to make sure that the federal government is doing what they're saying they're going to do. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I find that ironic that the Premier, the Minister of Business, and the member from Sydney Whitney Pier signed letters in support of this issue. Mr. Speaker, the people who were injured, injured in the mines deserve to have ongoing support as long as they need it. Since they were federal employees when they were injured, the federal government is responsible for paying for their extended benefits. All the province has to do, and I'll table the letter from Public Services and Procurement Canada, to this effect is to amend the WCB Act to provide earning replacement benefits for this specific group of workers past the age of 65. Mr. Speaker, with this information now, will the Minister of Business encourage his government to make the simple legislative change to allow the federal government to provide these disabled minors with continued means of survival? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and this is part of the issue, and this is why people get so upset with politicians. We can't categorize this in a way that's that simple. We can't simply make an amendment to the Workers' Compensation Act for one group of employees who are federal employees. It's impossible to do. If the federal government has that, that focus and they want to help the DEVCO miners, they should. The Premier, myself, the, the, the member from Sydney, uh, Whitney Pier, we did write support letters when we met with the, the DEVCO miners, all of us a number of times. We do some support their position that they believe they should, their, their benefits should be extended to perpetuity. If the federal government wants to do that, we can help them find a mechanism to do that. Their federal Order, employees... Please. The Honourable Minister of Business has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. They're federal employees. It's a federal act. If there's a way for the province to, to help ensure that that money gets to the, 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 those DEVCO workers, we can, but we can't do it by amending provincial legislation. This has been very form, formed and explained very unfairly to the point where there's an anger and a focus on the province. This is a federal government responsibility. We'll play a role and support the DEVCO miners, but the federal government have to do their job here. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we just heard the last two government ministers and premiers saying that they don't like our anger and focus on the government and what they're doing. But frankly, we were not elected to be the government's cheerleaders. We were elected to hold this government accountable for how they're spending our money, or should I say the taxpayers' money. And that's our job. And we're going to do it despite their uh, discomfort with it. My question is to the premier. It's never too late to do the right thing. The Premier said many times that he wasn't previously aware of allegations against the member for Yarmouth, or he would have acted. Yet now that he knows, the Premier has refused to do anything concrete. The question is, why is that, Mr. Premier? The Honourable Premier. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the honourable member for the, uh, the question, Mr. Speaker. I want to tell her, uh, Mr. Speaker, the letter that was sent to you uh, on uh, Monday that was cc'd to myself and the other leaders in this House, referred by two former members, Mr. Speaker, with uh, allegations in those letters. Uh, Mr. Speaker, also as part of that letter, uh, it was said that I was informed of this back in 2013. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I took this issue seriously the next morning. I flipped through my entire records in the Premier's office as well as those in my constituency office, Mr. Speaker, at no time. Uh, did, I, did I have any correspondence from there, Mr. Speaker? I continue uh, to take the, all of the issues related to this. But let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker, at no time, at no time did anyone tell me that anyone of my team was in a physical, physical altercation, Mr. Speaker, with anyone in this House. The Honourable Leader, uh, pardon me, the Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, if members of this House, including me, are to feel free to do their job free from intimidation, we need strong leadership of this government. Yet the Premier has repeated many times that the key effort that he took was to undertake a thorough search of his correspondence to make sure that he isn't held accountable for what was happening with his own caucus years ago. To paraphrase Bob Sager, he's quite happy, happy to act like he doesn't know now the things he didn't know then, but he does know now. And Nova Scotians know he knows now. And even Dr. AJ in a Nova Scotia Health Authority bullying of physicians, the first paragraph says, but the Premier has refused a review of allegations by three MLAs of harassment by the Minister of Education. So Nova Scotians want to know, even if he doesn't want to tell us. So my question for the Premier one last time, is the Premier prepared to take any additional steps to learn the facts about the accusations that have been levied against his minister by a current sitting member of the legislature or all those previous members who've experienced the same thing. The Honourable Premier. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to tell her uh, the letter came to you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, uh, the Honourable Member should know by now, Mr. Speaker, that you're the person charged of the province house, not the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, those two former members, uh, Mr. Speaker, the allegations that were brought forward, I saw Order, no please. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage will retract that statement that I heard very clearly. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. I'm, I'm, uh, I'll retract the statement. Thank you. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for, uh, for her question. Uh, tell you the information that was brought to my attention, Mr. Speaker, was looked into. Uh, Mr. Speaker saw no evidence that was related to that information that had come to me, Mr. Speaker. Uh, those two former members are no longer members of this House, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, too, read the article uh, from, uh, that the, the Honourable Member quoted from, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there was uh, zero facts throughout the entire article, which referenced a number of issues, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but I will continue to, to tell uh, Mr. Speaker that the issue of violence is one this government takes seriously, Mr. Speaker. It's why we continue to invest in a sexual violence strategy across the province, Mr. Speaker. And at any time, Mr. Speaker, if it's brought to my attention that there's been a physical altercation with any members of our, our team, with anyone in this House or outside, Mr. Speaker, I will take action. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. I recently met with members of the Nova Scotia Association of Community Health Centres. They represent a community health model that helps reach the most vulnerable, 30 per cent actually, of the population with timely and preventative care. They also provide that critical local voice that often gets lost in health care after the consolidation of health authorities. We all know that we're losing those local voices. So I will ask the Minister, is he from familiar with the Community Health Centre model and its role in filling the many gaps in our health care system. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I am familiar with uh, the organization and the work uh, that they do and their, and their uh, partner organization. Uh, uh, community-based uh, health care delivery, and Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, much of the uh, work they do uh, really is, is modelled and, and very similar to uh, the collaborative uh, practice teams that uh, are being established across the province, uh, bringing together a, a, a group of health care professionals to provide the care that's needed uh, to Nova Scotians and communities from one end of the province to the other. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, we continue to invest to ensure that Nova Scotians do get access to those primary care health needs uh, are met. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer, but the reason why I'm asking this question is because the Nova Scotia Association of Community Health Centres has been trying to get the Minister's attention. 
and, and have his ear. This, these health centers want a place at the table and recognition of the role they play in our communities. They have a focus on social influences on health, which are critical, Mr. Speaker, for managing health issues that can later end up in expensive emergency visits. And it seems to me that the minister and the NSHA would want to meet this group. So my question is, will the minister commit to sitting down with this association as soon as possible because they've been asking for a year. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, uh, the work uh, that's ongoing uh, within the uh, the department and the health authority uh, to meet the primary care uh, needs of Nova Scotians. We recognize that the, the primary concern, Nova Scotians getting attached to primary care providers. That's why we continue to put a focus on uh, our investments in collaborative care teams, on our recruitment and retention initiatives, Mr. Speaker, modified the incentive uh, programs. We uh, expand the training opportunities for nurse practitioners we expand the training opportunities for physicians to meet those needs, Mr. Speaker. We continue to invest uh, another $10 million this year to establish and expand those collaborative care teams and communities across the province. Uh, so again, we continue to respond to the, uh, the expectations of Nova Scotians to improve access to primary care from one end of the province to the other. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Did he say? All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question's uh, for the minister responsible of the coroner's office. Mr. Speaker, a former constituent of mine recently passed away suddenly at home. He was pronounced deceased by a doctor over the phone with EHS paramedics present. I do have uh, uh, the authorization from his family to talk about this, although I will not say his name now. Mr. Speaker, his family was surprised to learn that the body would remain in the kitchen where he passed until the coroner's office came to remove it. Mr. Speaker, it took six hours despite repeated calls to the coroner's office from the RCMP for somebody to show up and remove his body. Will the minister please commit to explaining to the bereaved family how departmental policy would allow such a clearly traumatizing incident to occur? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from my colleague. Uh, I wasn't previously aware of these circumstances, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there is a body rem removal service contract in place uh, for purposes and circumstances such as this, uh, but I'd be more than willing to, uh, to speak with my colleague, get the uh, specific details of this matter, and look into it further. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister. I'm sure the Minister will appreciate the stress and emotion that was involved in uh, the situation. And, and let me repeat, the family was in the room with the body for over six hours while their loved one laid on the floor where they had fallen. Mr. Spe Speaker, clearly these circumstances are unacceptable. I'd like to know if the Minister would please commit to reviewing the procedures surrounding the removal of bodies by the Coroner's Office to ensure that this does not happen again and that bodies are removed in a timely manner. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I acknowledge uh, my colleagues' points that these are very traumatic circumstances for a family to experience and the stress associated to those circumstances uh, would be very difficult, Mr. Speaker, but I do want to say to my colleague, he doesn't have to wait to bring these types of questions to the floor of the Legislature. He can engage me at any time, as many of his colleagues have, to address these circumstances in a very timely and efficient manner. I commit to that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Earlier this week in Law Amendments Committee, Alex Stratford, Executive Director of the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers, spoke about the need for a child and youth advocate office in this province. Mr. Stratford called for the government to establish an advocate office with a broad mandate to look at systemic issues affecting young people. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why we don't see funding for a child and youth advocate office in this budget? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Indeed, uh, currently the Office of the Ombudsman takes on this particular role. Uh, they do visit all of our uh, facilities where young people are um, 
are, are housed. Uh, when when a young ch a young person comes into care, they are, are let know that if they, they feel if at any time their rights have been trampled, that they can contact the Ombudsman's office. I want to let the Honourable Member know that in fact uh, we do know that they make regular use of that uh, ability. And uh, one of the other issues is that we have been waiting for the, uh, the second report uh, from the Home for Coloured Children to come out to see if that gave, gave us any direction on that particular issue. Thank Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is the only province in Canada that does not have a Child and Youth Advocate Office in place. In documents we received in response to a Freedom of Information request, an email from September 19, 2018 says, Quote, DCS would like to spearhead the creation of a Child and Youth Advocate Office. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister explain what has changed between September and now? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Again, I, I think I've answered that in our previous answer, that in fact we do have the Ombudsman's Office that is fulfilling this particular role at this time. Uh, we do know that young people do make use of, this, of the uh, services that are available from the Ombudsman's Office. The Ombudsman does go out regularly to our child caring facilities to in fact engage with young people, and I want to let her know that uh, this is a, an issue that we are certainly examining, and we did want more information uh, on the Home for Coloured Children report. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my question today is for the Minister of TIR. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, Cameron Collieries is a private company that has made a huge investment in the economy of Cape Breton Island. Part of that investment is the building of a road to bypass a very busy community in, in, of uh, Dominion Street. The Department of TIR is responsible for building the entrance and the exit on this new road. One of the exits is on the Glace Bay Highway, Mr. Speaker, which is a very busy road, four, four lanes wide. My, my understanding is there's no intention of putting a traffic light system there. And I think that would be a, a serious mistake, and I'm wondering if the minister would let us know if indeed there will be traffic lights there because they have quantity of coal, trucks moving by across two lanes of traffic to get into the traffic flow could be a very danger, dangerous situation for the motoring public. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the member for bringing the matter forward. Yes, uh, we are engaged in, in uh, making some changes there to alleviate the emergence of the uh, significant truck traffic or a significant investment on behalf of the company in the private uh, portion of the road. And uh, we intend, of course, once we get the intersections up, to review those in terms of our traffic control processes with our experts, study the volumes, and the decision will be made to make sure that that intersection is safe. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the Minister for the answer to that question. And Mr. Speaker, this may very well be my very last question in the House of Assembly, so it goes to the Minister of TIR, and I have to know, I have to know, what is his plan for the new Boston Road? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. And I thank the member for the question. I think it would be a sad day to see the last of him in the House. <laughs> However, uh, the department is receiving significant, significant constant input from the three residents of the new Boston Road. <laughs> and there is a recommendation that the name of that road be changed to the Alfie McLeod Road. And, we are carefully studying that option, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That is good news. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I had a constituent visit the ER uh, at Christmas time when the doctor immediately interviewed him about the surgery he had recently had to treat his lung cancer. The problem is he didn't have lung cancer and he hadn't had surgery. This gentleman and his wife attempted for quite a while to get his records corrected, but despite calling medical records who contacted Nova Scotia Health Authority lawyers, they were told that they couldn't undo what was already in the record, and it took a call from my office to remind medical records department uh, of the Health Information Act that they could in fact correct the records. 
Uh, it shouldn't take a call to an MLA's office. So my question to the Minister of Health is, is his department tracking how many times the wrong records end up on somebody's uh, medical record chart and uh, how many times uh, this happened in the past year? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the, the member uh, clearly uh, highlighted the importance of uh, accurate uh, health care information uh, being available both to uh, patients as well as uh, health care uh, providers. Uh, with uh, that in mind, uh, we are embarking upon a, uh, uh, an investment, Mr. Speaker, to provide new technology and systems that have uh, auditing uh, mechanisms in place and provide a single repository for uh, health care records, the One Patient, One Record uh, initiative, Mr. Speaker. As far as the specific uh, data that the uh, members requested, I don't have that, uh, those types of details uh, right here on hand. The Honourable Member for Cold Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I, the Minister indicated that he might have those answers, so if so, I would uh, appreciate having a copy of it. Mr. Speaker, um, everyone knows that um, health records are extremely private, but there are often times when they get labeled inappropriately and people end up with the wrong records. And I had an opportunity to speak with the minister about the fact that another constituent had gotten copies of a continuing care plan for a member of his family, but it was belonged to someone else. And then the next week, he got a second continuing care plan from a private agency and that also belonged to someone else. And then he got a third continuing care plan that did indeed have his family member's name on it, but none of the uh, information was correct. So can the minister tell me if he's tracking how many times errors are wrong when it's a private agency that's hired by the Nova Scotia Health Authority? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, we do have the uh, FIA uh, legislation, uh, the Personal Health Information Act, uh, which does, uh, of course, uh, identify the responsibilities of custodians of uh, health care, uh, personal health care information, Mr. Speaker, uh, and their obligations to ensure uh, the accuracy and the, the reporting of the uh, any uh, issues, uh, Mr. Speaker, or breaches uh, that go uh, beyond the... Um, the purview or, or issues particularly with inappropriate access or breaches uh, of that uh, information, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so uh, again, they're uh, clearly laid out uh, through that legislation uh, and all custodians uh, from physicians, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, to uh, throughout the health care system, uh, that uh, legislation would apply to personal health information. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a child living in poverty is at a very high risk to become an adult living in poverty. A generation has passed since 1989 when all parties in the House of Commons passed a resolution to end child poverty by the year 2000. Since that, since that time, the child poverty rate in Nova Scotia has soared instead to 19%. And in 2015, 35,890 children across this province were living in low-income families. In 2015, the Canadian Centre for Policy Research revealed statistics showing more than one in five children in Nova Scotia live in a low-income household. But the federal riding of Cape Breton can so? It's one in four, Mr. Speaker, and in the federal riding of Sydney, Victoria, it is one in three. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister of Community Services find it acceptable that Cape Breton has among the highest poverty rates in the province? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Um, and I think it's quite similar to one she asked me in estimates yesterday. As I indicated, uh, since that time uh, when those statistics came out, Mr. Speaker, there have been a number of investments, both federally and provincially, and I walked her through the investments that have made, been made by the federal government, which included in 2017-18 nearly $600 million coming to the families of this province to assist. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we've been making our investments as well, and they are not we have been building income security for families here in Nova Scotia. And one of the things that I spoke about, for example, is a project that's underway in Cape Breton to get workers to work because we found out that there were actually a thousand jobs that were going unfilled in Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker, because people actually couldn't get transportation. That's one of many things we're doing, and I will outline those in my second answer. Thank you. The Honourable <laughs> Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. 
Mr. Speaker, and yes, yesterday in estimates, as the minister points out, I did ask her questions on this, um, and she pointed out that child poverty on Cape Breton Island has always been an issue, referring to it as a statistical outlier, and I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that sometimes we do feel that way. Mr. Speaker, the federal riding of Cape Breton Canso has the second highest level of child poverty in all of Nova Scotia. My provincial constituency is within this federal riding, Mr. Speaker, and it concerns me to hear those numbers. It especially concerns me to know that children on Cape Breton Island are living in such disadvantaged circumstances. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister admits that she does not know why the rates for childhood poverty are so high on Cape Breton Island, is she prepared to ask the government to please commission a report to finally find answers for these children and their families who continue to hoard? They go without, Mr. Speaker, to historically go without. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. As I indicated to the Honourable Member, uh, the, the numbers that came out recently from Statistics Canada were, for 20, were from 2017, which is before we began making a number of investments uh, across this province, including things like allowing people who are living on income assistance to keep more of the money they earn when they are able to earn, Mr. Speaker. That was the first part of the standard household rate. Later this year, we will roll out the second part of the standard household rate, Mr. Speaker. But that's not all we're doing. We are taking a number of steps, Mr. Speaker. What I would uh, point out to the Honourable Member, there have been things like, like the uh, doubling the uh, poverty reduction credit. We, there are all kinds of different things we're doing, and it's not just our department, Mr. Speaker. If we look at, at the Department of Education, for example, the, fr the free pre-primary program is an anti-poverty program. We know that children who do better in school and children who go through a program like this are more likely, Mr. Speaker, to do, uh, if they're better, they do better in school, they're more likely not to have involvement with the health care system. We know that we have uh, free breakfast programs in 93% of our schools across this province, Mr. Speaker. And I hope to see you back at budget estimates and we'll talk about it more. Mr. Thank Mr. you. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Recently, it was announced by the Health Authority that the medical laboratory position at Buchanan Memorial Hospital will be reinstated and that the posting for the position will go out. Mr. Speaker, this was very welcome news to all the communities north of Smoky and the staff of Buchanan. So my question to the Minister, could the Minister please inform the House as to whether or not this position has been posted and the duration of the posting? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is my understanding that the posting uh, should be up. Uh, I haven't uh, looked uh, at the uh, job postings for the Health Authority, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, myself to uh, validate that, but indeed all Nova Scotians, certainly any uh, lab technicians that have that expertise uh, could go to the uh, website uh, with the career postings and, and verify. Uh, and uh, as far as how long the posting goes up, I, I'm not sure. I think there's usually a, a standard uh, duration of maybe a few weeks or a month, uh, but I don't don't know exactly uh, how long it's open while they're seeking candidates, but I will advise the member that if a, if a position goes unfulfilled, uh, they do uh, re evaluate why they think it may have been uh, unfulfilled and repost uh, the posting at a future date. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister realizes the importance of having the continuance of this position at the hospital while the posting takes place. So very simply, I want to ask the Minister, can he guarantee that the position will continue to have a technologist in place until this position has been permanently filled? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I believe uh, efforts are being made uh, to ensure the continuity of the services uh, being delivered there. Uh, so uh, again, that's, uh, that's, that's part of uh, work that's going on. Uh, but again, it does rely on uh, people with the appropriate skill sets uh, being uh, willing and able and available uh, to fill that uh, space. So I uh, can't give 100% certainty uh, if we're, uh, you know, but uh, the efforts are being made to ensure that they do have continuity of those services. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Immigration. A 2017 Conference Board of Canada report on immigration to Atlantic Canada discussed strategies for strengthening retention of immigrants to the region. One challenge identified is that the province has cast a wide net and has been selecting immigrants based on their ability to integrate economically rather than on developing a critical mass of immigrants from certain countries and placing weight on their family or social ties to the region. 
private sponsorship of refugees is often used as a tool for family reunification. Mr. Speaker, is the minister lobbying her federal counterparts to allow Nova Scotia to welcome more refugees? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I very much appreciate the question. Let me uh, take the opportunity to once again thank all Nova Scotians for the support when they supported and sponsored uh, so many refugees to this province. Uh, I can tell you, sitting at the FPT tables, I can tell you that Nova Scotia uh, was loudly talked about because we, in fact, in this province at that time when, the, when that hit in 2015-2016, on a per capita basis, we sponsored the most uh, privately sponsored refugees across the country as a percentage. And that is something I'm very proud of. I'm also proud to say that many, many, many of our uh, uh, families, uh, groups of fives, uh, organizations have continued to work and to sponsor and to bring families of those that are already here. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, sponsoring groups provide refugees with lodging, settlement assistance, and support for their first year in Canada. In 20, 2004, groups in Manitoba established a private refugee sponsorship assurance program to guarantee financial support for, to sponsorship agreement holders and constituent groups who undertook family or com community-linked refugee sponsorship in the unlikely event of a breakdown in sponsorship, and it meant that church and community groups who sponsored the loved ones of a resettled refugee were covered if somebody integral to the sponsorship died or got sick and couldn't support the sponsee during that first year. Mr. Speaker, given the heartfelt desire of many newcomers in Nova Scotia to be reunited with family members, will the minister commit to establishing a provincial assurance fund for sponsorship agreement holders in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It also gives me the opportunity to inform members and all Nova Scotians of something that I don't know if many uh, had known at the time, but in 2015, 2016, this province, uh, with the help of the Premier, uh, my office staff and others brought together all Nova Scotia stakeholders, all SAPs, all uh, 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 agreement holders uh, from the churches, from ISANs, EMOs, uh, all settlement partners, brought them all together and we actually formed a committee in anticipation of what could possibly happen. And it was as a result of that that we have uh, been able to retain and support all of the refugees that are here. And it's because of that it, that they have all uh, virtually probably 99% of state and have brought many more uh, families to this province and we continue to do that. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, in Nesbitt, the Minister of Health stated that when an international medical grad lands a Dalhousie residency seat in the first round of the matching system under the Canadian Residency Matching Service, they have to sign a return to service agreement. This agreement binds them to five years of medical practice in an underserviced area of the province. And this seems like exactly the sort of thing that can help our rural and underserviced communities like many in Cape Breton to keep healthy and growing. So my question to the Minister, is it true that Dalhousie students that are able to do a residency here do not have a return to service agreement in terms of their, as terms of their residency? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, residency spaces themselves that are for uh, national uh, students, they're part of the national uh, program, that uh, they uh, in and of themselves do not have uh, return of service associated with them. That's part of the uh, training uh, program initiatives. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, uh, associated with tuition relief, uh, debt forgiveness, and uh, other incentive programs that we have does help support uh, residents that are training in Nova Scotia and, uh, and may choose to stay here. We make those available uh, so that uh, they do have a return of service associated with those financial supports. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I really believe that these agreements would help more Nova Scotians secure reliable, quality health care in their communities. And beyond that, it would help medical grads from here in Nova Scotia stay in their communities, grow their families, and help build a generational fabric that keeps these communities alive. So my question is to the Minister, will the Minister commit to sitting down with Dalhousie University and others to chat about how we might better leverage return to service agreements for graduates seeking residencies here? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, conversations are continue and are ongoing with our partners uh, throughout the, the healthcare system, from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, looking at uh, various licensing opportunities uh, for uh, different uh, classifications of, of uh, physician services that they can provide. Uh, the uh, Dalhousie Medical School and work with the residency uh, physicians themselves, Mr. Speaker, who are needed to provide supervision preceptor for both residents and the practice ready assessment and the health authorities as well, Mr. Speaker. So we continue to engage in those conversations uh, ongoing throughout the year to come up with uh, strategies and initiatives and opportunities to change. It's one of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, we've expanded the number of residency seats, 10 family physicians, 15 specialists in Nova Scotia, only province to do so. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Mr. Speaker, my last question will be this. Last session, the minister proposed to be a UFO buff, the Minister of Transportation. Is that really true, Mr. Speaker? Because I ask, because six months later, no sign has appeared on 103 to identify Shag Harbour and its, in its significance. Mr. Speaker, apparently he's waiting for the day the earth stood still until he agrees Shag Harbour is big enough, mysterious enough, and truly a final frontier that deserves a sign at the very best. Mr. Speaker, when are we going to get a sign for Shag Harbour? Order, please. The time allotted.